And so now I want to welcome our moderator and panelists for our next panel, uh, which is on smart, safe, and sustainable buildings. Um, our moderator is Lisa Brown, Senior Director of Municipal Infrastructure and Smart Communities at Johnson Controls. So Lisa, please make your way to the stage. And then our panelists are uh, Scott McRitchie, uh, North American Director of Sales and Marketing at Fire FM. We also have Wendy Austin Gray, Senior VP at International Wellbeing Institute, Pat Edward, uh, Borough Manager, Collindale, Pennsylvania, and John Brooks, CEO of America's uh, Globe Tom. Yeah. So I'm going to, is that what that is? Okay. Let me see if I can lean my stuff here. So good morning. It's so nice to see everyone. And, um, so I'm Lisa Brown, I'm the Global Director for Government for Johnson Controls, and uh, more importantly, a very, very proud and long-term member of the Smart Cities Council. Um, it was interesting when Chris was talking about those dates back in the Stone Age of 2013, 2015, I was actually at those meetings. Um, and there was, a le there was less of us, I think, that were focused on sustainability and smart, connected and resilient communities, but we were a crusty group and we are very resilient, and it's good to see that some of us are still standing. Um, and Chris is definitely a champion there. Oh, okay, thank you. So this is a wonderful panel. I'm, I'm delighted to, um, to have our folks here because we're gonna dig in on, from a, pri a private as well as a public sector standpoint with all these subject matter experts um, in the areas of IoT and building performance standards, and I'm glad that Chris mentioned that, and life safety, and telecommunications, and connectivity. And I believe that the panel is called um, Smart, Safe, and Sustainable Buildings. So we thought because, and similar to the folks who've been at the smart, um, looking in the smart city space for so long, the word smart and um, the concept of smart cities has been so vague or differentiated. And at one point, when we were looking at the concept of smart cities about 14 years ago, my colleague, um, Clay Nessler, who's at the World Resource Institute now, we came up with 29 different definitions that people had given us. So I said to him, being the elder statesman that he was, I said, what do we do? And he said, throw out the list. So we threw out the list and we decided what was most important to our partners, to ourselves at Johnson Controls, but most importantly to what our customers wanted. And uh, we focused on understanding that it's a customized situation. So with that in mind, I thought that I would ask the panelists to um, first introduce themselves. Um, we have a wonderful group, and then we're going to go into a quick speed round to define what we think is smart, safe, and sustainable, and go from there. So I have John with us. John, if you want to just say a quick who you are, where you're from, and um, we're going to kind of keep it short, and then we'll go down the row. So I'm uh, John Brooks. I'm the CEO of the Americas for Globatom. We're a 20-plus-year-old uh, company that's uh, primarily founded in telecommunications. We moved off into aviation and travel and into smart cities um, in the last uh, five or six years now. And um, our technology stack is designed to produce the foundational layer, uh, the data foundation layer and integration layer for uh, smart communities in general. Thank you, John. Pat. I don't know, Corey promised me there was going to be food, so that's why I showed up. Food. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, um, we'll feed you later. Yeah. No, I'm a uh, municipal administrator for the borough of Collingdale. It is a, a small town in Pennsylvania, southeast corner of Delaware County. Um, 49 municipalities, but we're one of the 49. We're one of 27 boroughs. Uh, a little under 9,000 people. I have a staff of 50 and a budget of between, um, on a good day, $7 million, on a bad day, $5.4 million. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Hi, everyone. Uh, Dr. Whitney Austin Gray. I work with the International Well Building Institute. I lead research there. Um, so I'll be speaking from the perspective of health for our populations. So moving into the pandemic, we had certified 400 million square feet. We are now at 4.6 billion. So the conversation around health, sustainability, um, is so critical, and you'll hear me reiterate that a lot around partnerships to create healthy um, buildings. And we'll also talk about the um, work we're doing on the city level as well to create healthy communities. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott McRitchie. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing for a company called FireM and LVX uh, Global Brand, one of your sponsors, Smart Cities. Um, 
We are a universal company that takes information out of fire panels and makes it accessible to smart cities. Uh, historically, the data has not been available to make interoperable decisions in building systems, but with the help of groups like yourselves wanting access to it, um, I'll be speaking to the benefits that having fire protection event data in your smart cities has on your infrastructure. Wonderful. Thanks, Scott. So we're going to start, as we mentioned, um, with the whole concept of smart. Smart meaning connected spaces. Um, what buildings that are smart, assets, your systems, people, what tech is needed, what use cases are out there, outcomes that are required, and what is smart enough. So I'm going to ask for John to start by saying Globe Tom's definition of smart, smart buildings. And you can use just one word or a quick phrase, and then we'll, but we'll go from there. I was going to say, that how, how, how much time do we have? One word, John. <laughs> one word, OK. Um, smart for, for us um, really boils down to uh, a, a conversation of, um, well, resiliency. OK. And I know we talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, I, 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 yeah. It's oh, okay. well, sorry. Go ahead, I'll pick Pat. another word. That's okay. Resiliency is good. Pat, smart, smart buildings. Uh, well, I would say uh, speaking for the borough of Collingdale, and you know, I used to work for the city of Philly as well. Uh, smart in the building would be, um, I guess, us learning from, you know, previous mistakes dealing with infrastructure. Um, so I would leave it at that. Yeah. Um, I I will go with that. It's a building you can trust. I think a lot of people do not trust that their building will work for them, for their health, for their community, um, and they distrust the spaces they're spending time in. And I think we need to reestablish the connection of trust on multiple levels for health, for the environment, and for safety. Coming from an industry where the information wasn't easily available, uh, smart to me is interoperable. Finding ways to take information and translate it across all sensors and all platforms make it usable for not only occupants, but also property owners and managers. So that's great. Resilient, trust, trusted, and um, interoperable. It's fantastic. You know, I'm going to go to Whitney first because you mentioned um, really what smart buildings mean to you and you brought up public health and you talked about, again, um, the confidence that individuals have when they're either working, living, or serving in, in certain infrastructure. So if you could just tell us from the Well Building Institute standpoint, um, what is a smart building to you? Um, I think I'm going to pull the whole magic moment concept. I will say that we are writing the new chapter in the history book. People don't want to return to their buildings. They do not trust their spaces. We are re thinking about what work is. So you have now entered the new hybrid era of work. So the co-working era has closed, and you're now moving into this new era. So that means not nine to five, Monday to Friday, 45-year-old white male that's going to work and commuting an hour and a half each way, spending 90% of their time indoors. The formula that you have for the buildings that you operate has changed fundamentally. People want to spend different amount of time. They have different needs. There are different ages. They have different um, family dynamics. And so work the way that we knew it is changing. Expect all those formulas around the way that buildings are going to operate will change because those variables and human variables and human factors are changing. So with that in mind at the International Well Building Institute, we don't tell you how to design the building, but we tell you what matters for human health. And I never want to hear, and I've been in too many panels um, from the first day of my PhD actually, trying to answer the question, energy efficient or human health? And human health is just harder to measure, and it was harder to fight for. So now you're in it, we're in a pandemic, we always knew this would happen. We did not know the name or when. Um, but we did have estimates on what could happen. And I think for a lot of people that are nodding their heads that are in a conversation around climate change, you knew it can and is happening. And so we're not at a ask, we're at an action point. So the 4.6 billion square feet internationally that have certified for well, those can't just be healthy buildings. They have to be smart, sustainable, and healthy buildings. So a building that has no people in it, is it smart? 
a building with no people that had to shut down or maintain operations during the pandemic with no one in it, is that sustainable? And also, this is not a newsflash for many, but for some, is that we could have returned much sooner with buildings that could have operated um, with better air quality and more equitable for many community members that were forced to stay at home and be quarantined or isolated during a time in which our buildings could have actually helped them by coming to work and providing better air quality on certain levels. So we're at the chapter, we're at the magic moment, we're trying to rewrite this. It's not sustainability or, or smart or health. I wanna be part of every conversation. Um, so you'll probably see it today and all the meetings I'm in with you. It's in public health, I know my stuff, but I don't understand everything about energy efficiency. And I'm trying to always raise my hand to ask because I think it's really challenging in these rooms to cross disciplines, to have these conversations so that we can get into the BTUs and the human health productivity units and actually measure, track, elevate, and propose changes for smart, healthy, and sustainable buildings and communities. Mm. And there's plenty of energy efficiency experts in the room. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna ask Pat, in your lovely town of approximately 9,000 people, and um, as history shows that you have a relatively new mayor, and before that, mm -hmm. you had a mayor that was there for, what, 45 straight years? 56. So, Amazing. Um, so, the uh, <laughs> so the question that I'm asking you, and with that frame, is um, are your, in your opinion and your current mayor's opinion um, and borough council, do you believe that your buildings are on the way of being smart? Or do you think there's a lot more investment to go? Well, firstly, let me, um, let's pay homage to the, to the late uh, Frank C. Kelly, who uh, passed away actually maybe like a year before I started there. Mm. Um, longest sitting mayor in the history of Pennsylvania. Um, <clears throat> so as for your question, unfortunately, we have the Jetsons and the Flintstones. Unfortunately, a lot of places in Southeast Pennsylvania, even Central Pennsylvania, of all of Pennsylvania, are living in the Flintstone era, um, where you know we've always done it this way. But it's like, hey, there's a hole in the ceiling and there's water coming in, but we've always done it this way. So I think a lot of it is culture and connectivity. So we have to change the culture around how we feel about um, renovations. And to her point about you know smart, safe, and um, installing people in the process. Um, I, Hmm, I'm trying to choose my words carefully. Um, so I would say right now we're not, we're not moving in that direction quite yet, but a lot of repairs have been made. Like um, we spent a few thousand dollars on roof repair. Um, there were some wire issues that are be, that's being taken care of this week. Uh, we had some roofing in the park. They're using different, more sustainable materials. So there has been some commitment to that because I've been able to convince council to kind of work with me and be cooperative on those things. But I think it's like one thing at a time. So there's some vision, and you're moving in the right direction at some point. There yeah. are people that are interested. Yeah, I mean, the building was uh, erected in 1912. So it's been around for a very, very long time. So you know, so you know what I'm dealing with, right? Um, and people's mentality is still from 1912 as well. Um, so, um, but with that said, I think there, there's, the beauty is there's some opportunity because, because nobody's ever tried to do what I'm doing. I have a blank canvas where like I said, if I get the appropriate levels of cooperation and, and buy-in from council, because in our government, um, really council, it's council, the mayor, then me, and then everybody else. So, you know, if those two work in conjunction with each other and vote things my way, you know, I'll be able to do stuff. But also, I'm also looking to uh, make the borough of Collingdale's building a historical building, so then we'll get funding to do things that way and, you know, more sustainable, make things more sustainable. See, see it here, folks, that there's government in action, right? There's, there's uh, movement moving forward. So John, you mentioned when we were having a conversation previously that Globetom um, was looking at the whole idea of smart and utilizing on a concept that I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit about a city as a platform and just the whole connectivity and the levers that you provide folks. So could you explain a little bit about the city as a platform and how that kind of um, connects with the whole concept of smart? Um, so, going back a few years, um, six, seven years ago, back at the Telemanagement Forum out in Europe, we started putting together a lot of fundamental building blocks. 
of what a city as a platform would look like. Lobotom was one of the main participating members in that group. Um, and, and we have arranged and built our technology around those concepts. Um, what that allows us to do as a city as a platform is to do several different things. Uh, you're, you're able to now interconnect uh, cross department, you're able and, and, and synchronize data and get to a true view of what a citizen, a resident, a business, a parcel actually is. Uh, you can actually take data from anywhere within that community, IOT sensors, departments, other agencies, business partners, and so on, and be able to integrate that all into the conversation. Uh, you're able to now expose that data across agencies, so you can have different boroughs communicating with each other, different cities, different towns communicating with each other, uh, all seamlessly, all via API and so on. So it's a technology data platform link that you know, we're not the only game in town doing something like that, by the way. But the point is, all of these things that you want to do all generate data, whether it's at a macro level at a city, county, or state, or at a micro level at a building. You're generating information that has an outcome. Where are we putting that outcome? Are we making that available to citizens, to residents, to businesses to work with? Are we making that available to governments to actually hit sustainability, workability, livability goals? What are we doing with that information then to promote that going forward? What are the analytics, AI, and ML that we're incorporating into that information to actually reach the outcome that we're trying to get to? So city as a platform is that foundational layer, and it starts small, it starts big, it starts anywhere you like. But whoever you're getting that technology foundation platform from, what that's doing is it enables you to do all these other use cases. The, the interesting thing about city as a platform concept is that um, every municipal agency entity is going to eventually have to approach this. So the question is really more of a case of do you go down these niche siloed roads of doing individual types of activities to reach a certain micro sustainability goal? Or do you start laying the foundation first and then build those goals off of that? Because that becomes extensible when you have that city as a platform basis in place. Thank you. And are you, I think we're seeing more of our government leaders and municipal leaders that are really starting to embrace more um, and lean more into technology than ever before. And I would ask Scott, um, it's the whole concept of interoperability, right, and connectivity. How are you seeing that in the life safety space, similar to what John just mentioned in terms of connectivity? Uh, we are much slower than everyone else uh, in terms of technology. This Flintstone era that you just mentioned, let's start there. <clears throat> so in fire protection, a lot of the integrators and contractors and city officials have a code that we live and breathe by. Realistically, if an NFPA code comes out in 2014, it's not likely that it gets adopted for several years. So what does that mean? It means that everything that happens in our buildings, our technologies, we are lagging behind the possibilities that other industries already have access to. So John, you know, a platform that you're building out for a city, I have a very good idea that you're not getting a whole lot of life safety data streaming into the platform. Probably because number one, we're usually last on the list to be asked for that information because we're not a, can I say, sexy part of building out infrastructure. But it is a foundation of keeping a building safe, sustainable. So one of the things that we are intent on doing at LVX and within the FireM platform is making it available and getting it in the hands of occupants, <clears throat> building owners, and anyone that can improve what's already in place so we don't have to make those improvements on hardware alone. You can take something that's already there and get the information into a platform like John's so that we can make better decisions. Thank you. So being married to a 25-year career firefighter, um, I think he would take offense to the not sexy thing, but he's not here, so we don't have to <laughs> worry about that. That is the only sexy part of the fire industry. <laughs> they make calendars, I heard. Yeah, they do. <laughs> Moving along, um, you know, and that's a perfect segue into our next chunk uh, which is safe, right? And so I want to just frame it by saying, and we're going to ask that one one word speed round again. Um, public safety has really been in the news 
um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I know we had a wonderful opportunity with the, the Democratic um, Mayors uh, Alliance actually brought on Mayor Greenberg, who was the new mayor of um, Louisville. And we had a wonderful one-hour chat with him, and then two days later, the Louisville incident happened. So um, it's always on the forefront of everyone's mind, um, safety in our communities, safety in our buildings, et cetera. So from a, um, a life and fire safety, from cyber and public safety, um, access control, um, the mention of indoor air quality, the safety of that, evacuation planning, um, having command centers, safe can mean so many things. So in your one word, John, safe buildings. I, I don't want to take your word. So <laughs> would you rather go first on that? <laughs> Let's go. Uh, I'd say it's not an accident. You either plan for health or you don't. You know, when, 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 we, when we talk about that, and, and I, I had a 15-year fire background, so I, I, I sympathize. Um, uh, for us, it is um, modernization. Because without that, um, you know, when you look at fire safety, for instance, if we don't have external access to water, if we don't have good access over uh, just, just ingress and egress routes in and out of buildings, much less the fire department being able to get there uh, at, at, at the appropriate times, at knowing where the life safety risk is at on arrival, uh, those, those are cru uh, crucial aspects for us. And in older buildings, that doesn't exist. So modernization for us is, is something that we consider to be very important. Pat? Proper planning prevents poor performance. Predictive actions, thank you. Scott? Uh, the communication aspect, how it goes out, where the information comes from, and how many points you have to make the best decision possible. All of those data points create the best possible communication path for everyone associated with the event. So safety has modernization, there's no accidents, predictive, and a communication um, platform. I'm gonna go to you right now, Scott, and say what trends do you see from a technology standpoint that's helping uplift the fire and life safety space and maybe some um, trends in terms of what you think the audience would like to know and what yeah. direction you're going yeah, for fire M. All right, lots of questions there. So I'll start with where we see the industry is going uh, is just having this data accessible to the other platforms in the building as well as taking the information from the other sensors and, and I'll give some examples. So, you know, just a fire protection system in a building, you, you think sprinklers, you think smoke detectors, you think pull stations. Um, realistically, and, and this is why I bring up the, the side of the unsexy, I'll, I promise I'll stop using that word by the end of the day. Um, usually when you hear an evacuation notice in a building, an occupant's first thought is this is probably something that's not a fire, but I need to get out. They're not worried about a fire, they just know they have to get out. So um, the trend in fire protection now is cross zoning information from multiple sensors in a building to know and verify it is truly an event. So just because a smoke detector is going off, the way that those sensors work, it could be a spider that has produced a nest inside of a smoke detector and evacuates an entire building. But if you have a tobacco sensor or a THC sensor cross-zoned with a smoke detector in that building and you get both of those, you probably know someone's smoking a cigarette in the bathroom. If you have the ability to look at the smoke control systems in HVAC and you realize there is smoke going from zone one, two, three, four across the building, that tells us, yes, this is a fire. We need to exit this direction. We can give you better information based on the location of the events and provide evacuation routes that are more optimal with the exit signs and everything in the building that makes it interoperable, as opposed to eh, and everybody gets out. That's not information, that's a signal. So, and Whitney, you mentioned that um, in the Well Building Institute, the certifications and just everything that's looked at, and I think we're all very familiar with LEED and that was kind of the precursor of um, all the different certifications for building and infrastructure, but um, a little bit more about um, the certifications that the buildings have and maybe how that would contribute to a safer environment. 
Yes, absolutely. So um, at the International Well Building Institute, we work with WELL. So WELL is the first and largest building certification system on human health. So our sister organization, our partners, um, LEAD, but we also have partners of BREEAM, Green Star. We work globally. So we are not focused on um, planetary sustainability. We're focused on human sustainability, and we make it very easy for all of our projects to go for both. They're not required to, though, and that's a different conversation, which is kind of interesting. But about 20% overlap we have with most green building rating systems. So why do you need a healthy building system? Um, fortunately, we're still looking at stats that EPA put out that around one to three buildings are a sick building. And if you remember the history of that, that was in response to 1972, OPEC oil crisis, we tighten the buildings and we put people inside of them and we see what happens. Sick building syndrome is a host of 10 symptoms that dissipate when you leave work. Buildings were making you sick, they weren't making you well. We have learned a lot and we don't just make buildings to prevent disease and injury, we are trying to also make buildings to promote health. So words like thriving in your space, that you're effective, that you can focus. Um, the number one largest predictor of how long you will live, this is a study that just came out of Harvard, is your relationships. So guess what? We don't thrive in isolation. We're not very good at that at all. So we need places that pull us back to be able to gather. Buildings do that. City environments do that. We have places that help us heal. And so well is up to a global vision to create places to help people thrive. And so inside of WELL, we have 10 different concept areas, air, water, light. We'll look at issues of thermal comfort, materials, but also mental health, community, right? This idea of how you bring people together to promote health. Um, I will again say we do not thrive in isolation. We can't. And so what we are up to is looking at how a building can make you want to come back, that can make you healthier. There are buildings in this world, um, I will pull out our friends in Beijing, where you will, the building is breathing for you. So literally you watch people walk in the front door and go, <gasps> because that's how bad it's gotten. So buildings could also protect us. They can make us want to be part of that community and they can do that in an energy efficient way. Um, I'll just highlight, because this is a fun example in DC, thermal comfort. Uh, so oftentimes I get this sort of, if we spend more energy for air quality, so if we drive down carbon dioxide load in the building, we're going to have to escalate our energy use. That's not accurate. Because you are, you are implying that humans are sitting in the same spot, nine to five, Monday through Friday, with the same needs. And they're just not. We're moving, we have different needs, thermal comfort we wear and are allowed to wear different things than the DC swamp days of summer. And so what we need from a building varies based on what people and diversity of people's needs are. So let's get smarter, let's use the technology, let's predict how people use space. Let's elevate and want them to come back to safe, effective and healthy buildings. And let's partner so that we don't make it easy for buildings to be sustainable or healthy. Right? We need to be thinking about how it can be both and be effective for people. So our home environments right now, we are watching this and studies are coming back saying we're having elevated PM 2.5 levels. We're seeing ergonomic issues um, develop. We're seeing isolation factors. So home isn't perfectly the answer and it's not equitable for many in this hybrid work scenario. But we have to rethink this new era of work. I don't want work to be the same. Work was killing us. It was killing us. The last 150 years in this country, we, we addressed physical hazards, and actually fire safety has a really brilliant history of what we've done in occupational health. We addressed biological and chemical contaminants. Your number one hazard right now for your work and how long you will live is your psychosocial hazards. That's what's killing us at work. And the buildings that we spend time in and our 90,000 hours is where we work. So uh, well is providing a roadmap. We're gonna help you certify. You don't have to do this alone. There is um, basically over 100 features and 500 strategies, and those are going to parallel a lot of our lead work and other global partners to make it easy, to make a healthy choice the easy choice, to elevate and recruit people back to buildings. And I wanna say this again, that they want to work in, and they understand or actually can trust that that space is safe for their health. Thank you.
and I think we're, we're learning more and more about well and all the different certifications moving forward, so it's, it's very valuable <clears throat> from the private as well as the public sector. We're gonna switch to sustainable, which is our last piece, sustainable buildings. So um, sustainable versus resilient. Um, some folks think of sustainability as their ability to thrive through pandemics, through having predictive analytics, creating microgrids, um, using sustainable materials, et cetera. So if, and if it drives investment, um, does it drive growth? There's so much in the news these days in terms of um, whether you're for ESG um, analysis or if you're not. And from a political standpoint, it's actually very tricky at times to have those conversations. So I'm gonna ask again the panelists to explain um, very briefly, because um, it doesn't seem like this one word thing is actually catching on, um, what you consider a sustainable building. John. A sustainable building for us, um, we, we look at sustainability on many different fronts, and uh, those are all uh, participating data points. And uh, we, we look at sustainability as, as an overall goal, and that goal, depending on the environment, depending on the, the local government, depending on the building and so on, um, those goals don't appear to be exactly the same, even though they seem to be gravitating towards the same direction. Um, so sustainability from, from our aspect is understanding what that goal is and then being able to incorporate the appropriate data levers in there to help achieve that goal. And what I mean by that is uh, when, when, we, when we talk about achieving some form of sustainability, uh, you know, we, we have to look at it and, and say, all right, what are the different inputs? There's, there's life safety inputs, there's power consumption inputs, there's air quality inputs, there's, you know, what, what are all the inputs that are gonna help achieve that goal? And, and, and what's, what's crucial for a lot of people to understand in that is that the goal is not, or the, you know, the, the outcome is not the goal that we're going for. Understanding the levers to pull to get to that outcome is what's important because the outcome that we're currently getting to isn't, isn't, isn't what we're going after. It's you know, what, what are we trying to address and get towards? And then our job from a technology basis is to make sure that the participating building, the participating community, whatever, understands the levers and data that they can pull, that they can change to get to that goal. Great. So those levers and all the money that's coming from the clean energy economy that Chris had mentioned before, Pat, do you think that those, are you gonna be able to utilize any of those levers to make your buildings more sustainable in Collingdale? Because outside of solar energy, there's nothing that's really actually like still completely clean. Because I know that um, for like electric cars, the um, there's still gas that's used to power the electricity that you know. So it puts us in a weird space. But um, from my notes here, from our our conversation the other day, I think that there's five five or six bullet points that I think um, would work in sustainability and resiliency. Um, in buildings, uh, reduce of energy consumption, um, improving a building's efficiency, uh, predictive and preventative maintenance, uh, increased productivity, uh, better use or utilization of resources, and the sixth part is, again, back to doctor's point, people, right? If people feel better going into spaces, um, and it goes back to culture, competency, and connectivity. Um, which in a lot of these small municipalities it just doesn't exist. Like I told you, there's 49 municipalities in Delaware County, 27 of them are boroughs. Uh, Collingdale is the fourth largest borough. Um, but again, we're in the Stone Ages, right? And um, oh, actually, one of the councilmen is here, uh, Councilman Hastings, um, came down. But uh, he's a, a, a technology guy. Like he literally knows everything about like computers. You're lucky. And he's been um, he's been one of my biggest supporters, him um, and the finance committee, um, council member Cotton who couldn't be here and um, vice president Calhoun. So it's really important when people, like you said, vision, but vision doesn't really matter if you don't have people that are um, committed to competency. And then when you're trying to bring things to their attention, there's, because sometimes there's a level of cognitive dissonance because again, we've always done it this way. Um, so if we can touch on those six bullet points um, and be um, genuine in what we haven't done right, right, since 1912, um, I think it puts us in a, in a better position. It, it's gonna be painful right up, but once we get to that point where we have, um, you know, 
certain things, like I said, solar power uh, or a green roof, you know, things of that nature will sustain. Like even now, um, I just recently put like those viney plants. So we have like plants. I put bamboo in the um, in the uh, in the windows inside of the administrative office because those things actually matter. You know, they do. I have plants, and unfortunately, my palm tree died. So a moment what? of silence for my palm tree. But um, I had to have like a money tree and a few other things. So I think those small, I think the small things matter. And sometimes we have to major in the minors. I agree. I love culture, competency, and connectivity. And did you say money tree? I thought I heard him say he had a money tree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a money tree um, in my, uh, it's like right by my computer, and I have one in, in my okay. house. Well, you're role modeling, which is fantastic, yeah. and that's what we all need to do, right? Yeah, you have to, you have to, set, the, you have to set the example. You and have? That's, that's the hardest part, because, you know, there's times where, you know, I just want to sit on my hands and do nothing. And I'm sure councilmen can, you know, <laughs> he understands where I'm coming from, but, but there's a reason that, you know, I was hired. There's a reason why he was elected. Uh, so I think it's important that we always have to look in the mirror and remember, remember the mission, remember the mission. You know what I mean? Right. So oh. the ROI of healthy buildings oh, or sustainability, yeah. Oh, you were going to, you're going to actually give me one word. <laughs> I was really trying hard with those. So okay. no, I'm not going to give you Go. one word. You sustainability. Said short, answer, short answer. Sustainable buildings. Okay. Well, so I like being asked this question because it has changed. And I, I think a sustainable building for me isn't a building that answers if. It answers when. Um, so you all just lived through a win, right? Not, not if these climate disasters are going to happen and not if a pandemic is going to happen. It's when it happened. Um, the second point I'd like to make, and we're not there, but I'd like to see sustainable buildings um, instill pride across our population. Um, I think there's a real different sense of what community pride and connection means coming through this time. And I think that too often the sustainable buildings over there with people that understand that. And that's true for healthy buildings, but it's different because health is one thing you can't live without. So when we start thinking about our kids, I have a little three-year-old, almost three, and it's like you think about the school, it's very interesting. You ask people, is it important that you work in a sustainable, healthy building? Is it important that your child goes to a healthy, sustainable school? Very different. The sense of pride, community, what does that mean, right? How is it not okay if it's not? Um, and when we look at the history, and this is very interesting within um, public health and how we design for health, even in hospital scenarios, we look at mental health populations. If you have pride in your space, if someone cared and spent the time to tell you why they invested in you and why you matter and why your health matters, um, planetary and human health matters, we find that those places don't need to be renovated every five years or 10 or 15 because people take care of it, they love it, they wanna be there, they tell people about it. So back to my previous point on trust, if you also tell people why you trust your building, what is the air quality? Why do we do this for you? We see this in the rental market, affordable housing. I have example after example, but I'd love to see pride in a healthy building, pride in a sustainable, smart building, and taking ownership for this mission and making it very personal because we, we have had a win and everyone has the story of when it happened. And 10 years ago, I feel like the tone was a little more if. Um, and I think there's a different responsibility when we're in an era of win. Great, thank you. We have only a few moments left, but I'm going to um, finish with my last question and then circle back quickly to John about rewarding behaviors because in the sustainability space. But Scott, from a, a fire life safety standpoint, what do your clients and your partners consider um, a sustainable practices and sustainable technology that can be adopted? Yeah, uh, getting the most out of what's already in place. Um, before we look to upgrade infrastructure before you look to create waste by ripping something out. Is there a way that we can enhance what's already sitting there? Are there different points in the building that we can take and aggregate to create better decisions without just throwing new hardware at it or just throwing <clears throat> a situation in place where we're spending money when it could be used in other places? Is there low-hanging fruit within the building, the technologies that can you know, create a better, more sustainable building for longer, the maintenance piece, the pride. I, I love that point because one of the biggest parts of the fire protection industry are the inspections that we do. 
The inspections are for two reasons. We want to make sure everything works, but we also want to make sure that we don't have to rip something out and replace it in two or in three years because the situation, the environment is not being kept up. So having something that is looked at on a regular basis and made sure that is this really something we need to replace or is this something that we can enhance? Yeah. And enhancing those existing assets is a sustainable practice, so I'm glad you brought that up. John, you had mentioned, just um, last point, in terms of some examples that you've seen on sustainable behavior rewarding. Can you just give us a, a brief understanding of what that is? And then I'm going to stop, see if there's any questions um, from the audience, and uh, go from there. Oh, great, thank you. So uh, th this is actually a really exciting piece of a city as a platform is uh, something we, 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 we brought in to play that they grew up out of our telecom background to where we could actually start incentivizing certain behaviors. And that behavior could be at a, at a resident level, at a business level, or at any, any level that you like, basically. But the idea here is that if you're moving towards sustainability goals, you're going to get a portion of the population that's going to sign up right now. They're in. They're going to do it. That's about this much of the population. How do you cast a wider net? How do you get a larger group involved in something like that? And that's where sustainability rewards comes into place. Uh, and, and now we can actually go through and through the data capture sustainable behaviors and be able to reward those behaviors. Now what that reward system looks like in a building, for instance, if we're conserving power, if we're doing more hoteling work, if we're doing you know what, whatever the, the, the uh, measurable sustainable behavior is that a city is using uh, public transportation and so on. We piloted this out in, in, in Europe, um, for instance, in, in Southeast Europe, uh, Southwest Europe, sorry, France. Um, anyway, um, when we went through and, and piloted this, we, we went through and set up a program to where um, using sustainable transportation or more sustainable transportation means actually resulted in a reward system that we actually managed as a crypto purse for those participants that they could then cash in for other programs. They could use for discounts on water bills, discounts on parking meters when they did have to drive their cars. But the most interesting thing about this is that it wasn't limited to a municipal agency. This was cross city, this was cross parts of the country so that if I gained rewards in one part of, of the country, I could actually redeem those rewards outside of that particular area. So, so this gives us opportunity to now cast a wider net and bring in additional partners into this, including business partners. So, so sustainable behavior is not something that uh, is, is inherently something that we all grab a hold of. We all support it. Everybody supports sustainable behavior. The question is who participates. And the idea with these programs is to help cast a wider net and bring more people into that. Fantastic. So, um, I want to just do a quick wrap up, and then I think I'll be if we're, uh, if we're ready to the next piece. So a smart, safe, sustainable buildings seems to be defined by the panelists as a resilient building that you can trust, that's interoperable, that's modern, where no accidents are caused proactively, where there's predictive analytics and maintenance taking um, place, where there's communication that's effectively flowing through the buildings, through the occupants, and um, through the city, it seems. And that we need to take into consideration the culture of the individuals and the occupants of the building, the competency of the individuals who are maintaining those buildings, and the connectivity between the buildings, again, the people, and then making sure that we're not ripping and replacing, which I think is a really important point to a lot of folks in the audience, but making sure that we're enhancing existing assets and that hopefully all of that will result in more pride for our buildings.